Okay. Hello, everybody, and uh, welcome once again. Uh, I'm Peter, and I'm here with Kristen. Good morning, everyone. And uh, yes, we have our new lineup today, uh, a bit of a different schedule today. So we are going to be running until uh, 1.30 our time, that's uh, Central Standard Time. So that's uh, half the time as it was last week, but we are going to have different presenters next week as well. So we're splitting it up in a different way. So um, we'll be uh, having shows every uh, 45 minutes and um, we're gonna be having 15 minute breaks in between. So for now, we are going to cross over to uh, Calico with her Beyond the Body show. So Calico is in Camas in Utah and we'll cross to her now. So take it away. Just a little runaway Forty-seven years and still I'm on the run Afraid of love I'm keeping God at bay Spending days in a nightmare ain't much fun I am just a little runaway For my misery always blaming someone else I'm really into judgment and delay But only hurting me <laughs> thank you so much and i just want to thank soren and frank for the music um the little intro is absolutely beautiful i'm so excited about it oh because we're all little runaways <laughs> we forgot we forgot where home was and uh that's what a course in miracles is all about how to get back and um so Put on your ruby slippers. We're going to take a little journey for a half an hour and figure this one out. Um, and before I forget, it was St. Patrick's Day yesterday, and I just, I, I need to mention it because I was raised in a first generation Irish Catholic family, and it was a high holiday, kind of like Christmas. And I just also need to say, St. Patrick wasn't Irish. He was actually sold by slavers to the Irish, <laughs> and he had many forgiveness opportunities in that, I'm sure. So on some level, um, I'm thankful for him and leading the way in this whole um, adventure called forgiveness. And uh, that kind of brings me to the, uh, <clears throat> there was a question that came in uh, this week, and it was, it was a beautiful question, and I feel like it, it is, totally noteworthy of, of really taking a little journey with, and that is, what does it mean to accept the atonement? Um, and this is kind of the crux of A Course in Miracles. Um, I remember in book studies, we would talk about at one -ment. And um, it always landed funny with me because it sounded like, oh yes, just go into a peaceful state, be at one, smile. And then I'd go on to yell at the banker or, you know, scream at someone on the phone or, you know, and, and lose any sense of peace that that word might have brought me. So um, today I kind of want to explore this as a verb, not as a noun. Um, to accept the atonement is actually an action. It's not a doing action. It's actually something that happens in the mind. and. Um, for me, um, I've been a meditator my whole life, and I, I used to go to sanghas and Buddhist temples and do group meditations just because I really enjoyed meditating with others, with a group of others. The problem was, and this was before really grappling with A Course in Miracles, the problem was um, I couldn't quiet my mind. And this came up recently at, down at La Casa. There was someone that was saying um, that they had a hard time meditating because they couldn't quiet their mind. And there was a sense of fear of even getting that quiet. And I remember when I first started meditating, thoughts would run through my mind and I couldn't, they'd just loop around. And I stop thinking of that. Stop thinking of that. You're meditating. Stop thinking of that. So it was a really hard process to get quiet. 
And um, then A Course in Miracles came in and it sort of shifted the way I meditate. Um, for me now, if a thought loops around, that's just a forgiveness opportunity. That's something on which I need to accept the atonement on. And it shifts the whole practice of meditation because now I get a much clearer idea of what I need to accept the atonement on. Because it really is whatever is hooking in my mind is something I need to forgive. And, um, you know, I have an example of this because I remember this so clearly. The first time I grabbed a thought that wasn't helpful. <laughs> and not that they weren't going through my mind all the time, but it was the first time I clearly saw it. Saw it. And it was so mundane. It, you could have let it slip by without even noticing it, but I didn't. And I thought, oh my God, this is what's upsetting my peace. And it was, uh, there was a group of people and I remember a thought going through going, huh, that woman shouldn't wear that color green. And I thought, who the hell cares? <laughs> I mean, where in the heck is that landing? Why is that thought even taking up space in my head? And really, if you look at this from A Course in Miracles, these are the thoughts that I'm projecting out. And there were many, many, for, and there still are, many forgiveness opportunities on the body called Calico because she was never okay. And that's a, that's a topic for another show completely on body shaming. But it was like me projecting this this woman shouldn't wear that color green was actually my projection of me not being okay. I'm not okay. And it has nothing to do with the color green. It has with me making someone else a correction for someone else out there. And that's an atonement opportunity. There is the beginnings of accepting the atonement. Now that's not the end. Just recognizing it is not completing accepting the atonement. And I just want to say, um, just because I've been repeating this all week, and um, it's kind of the nature of this program, so I'm going to say it here, and this is in the text, chapter two. The sole responsibility of the miracle worker is to accept the atonement for himself. So the sole responsibility for the miracle worker is to accept the, accept the atonement for himself. And this is, so seeing my projection out there of green, not good, she shouldn't wear that, was me projecting something that I was not okay with in myself. That this form needs to alter in many ways. It had nothing to do with color, it was size, shape, age, looks. I mean, everything about it wasn't okay. That's what I got growing up. And so I, I lived projecting this out on others to the point where I became a doctor. So I could, you would pay me money and I would tell you how to do, how to correct your life. I mean, it's a six, it's a, the whole thing is an insane system, but that's how I kind of managed my projections. And so the sole responsibility of the miracle worker is to accept the atonement for himself. So this is where the action takes place. And this is where, for my process, Spiri and the instrument for peace were critical. Just, I couldn't have done it without them. Um, well, I probably could have done it without them, but it was so much easier with them. So I was able to take things like, okay, I don't like that color green on that woman. What's really going on there? What's the feeling there? I want to change something. Something is not okay. And I would take that through this whole process of the instrument for peace, which then became the Spiri bot. And it would really take those feelings of what's really going on and shift them around so that you could see them, what's really happening, that it's just your projection of not seeing yourself as okay. 
And each little thought, and none of them are too small to take to Spiri, is, is my personal opinion. Because each little thought unwraps these beliefs that we hold on to about who we are in this so-called world. And each time I would unwrap it, I would feel more and more peace, more and more joy. And it really, and, and I also need to say symptoms. If you have a headache, you have stomach ache, you're, you've got the flu, take those to Spiri because those are just projections as well. So this, this whole thing of accepting the atonement is a huge undertaking. And I, I applaud anyone that really is taking on the process of A Course in Miracles and doing more than book study with it. Because this is where you can completely unwrap the mind. Because we were taught how to think, which, you know, that's like, you know, growing up in a world where the earth is flat and you better not forget it. Because it's critical that you remember the earth is flat because you walk too far, you know what's going to happen. Well, I had the same thing, you know, it's like, you're not okay. And if you would only lose five pounds and, you know, people would like you better or whatever your version of that is. Because we all have our own versions. We were all taught some version of the earth is flat. And the Course in Miracles, and through Jesus, it's actually Jesus is trying to tell us, you can unwind this. You don't have to live like this anymore. Isn't that a movie? <laughs> you don't have to think like this anymore. Solaris, that's it. It's a great movie. But that's not why we're here. Anyway, the atonement really allows for this process to unwind. And so, you know, David, you know, his book, Unwind Your Mind, it's a great title because that's the process. It's taking each little, and they don't even need to necessarily look like grievances. I mean, ooh, that color green on her doesn't really work. How many times have I thought that? I, you know, it's like someone walks into my office, go, oh, they've got a limp. It must be that right hip. You know, I mean, this is the way my mind has been. And I, I have a gift that I can see my thoughts. And that's, I mean, <laughs> I now see it as a gift. Before it was, you know, they, they have a diagnosis now, ADHD. Well, you know, I was, I was, it was always shh. I thought my name, David said once, he thought his name was don't. I think, I thought my name was shh. <laughs> I mean, I remember in fourth grade, oh, a little parable, I don't know why I'm sharing it, but I am. In fourth grade, my teacher, you know, there was a lot of conversations. You know, she talks all the time. And so they would move me from one desk to the other. You know, like, that's going to change anything. In my world, I just thought, oh, great, new people to talk to. <laughs> So it's like, yeah, my mind is very active, very active. And there's lots of useless information running through it. Meditating was the first step in quieting the mind to the point where I could slow those thoughts down. I still talk a lot. That's never going to change. But I can go into meditation now and slow those thoughts down so I can see them and identify, oh, grab it. Oh, this one needs to go to spirit. You know, this is not a helpful thought. And it's like, it's totally doable for all of us to go through this process. And I guarantee, and this one, you can take it to the bank. And my Irish grandmother used to say, you can take this to the bank. You know, not that I trusted banks at all, but you can, I get it. This one you can take to the bank. Each time you take on one of these negative thought patterns that you see wrapping through your mind and you clear it, Truly clear it, not just go, oh, there's a thought. Well, I'll just write that down here and leave it. Because it'll loop back in. And I, I knew I was looping. I'd have these consistent grievances come through. Um, you know, I, I had a foreclosure with Chase Bank. Speaking of banks, I had a, a, you know, they actually, it was a clerical error on their part, and they took my property. And I was fighting them. Oh, man, I was, you know, Irish angry. And that was pretty damn angry. And I was making them wrong a lot. And then I started thinking, you know, 
My sole responsibility as a miracle worker is to accept the atonement myself. And somehow I started, this started shifting. The whole image started shimmering. And quite frankly, a lot of my book study friends got angry at me for, for giving up on the fight, the good fight. But quite frankly, it was ruining my peace of mind. It was not making me happy. I was not happy. And so I really took on Chase Manhattan as one of my first forgiveness opportunities in this literal, you are this, your sole responsibility as a miracle worker is to accept the atonement. Forgive them. Because they're not real. They're just really making you miserable. And it's a thought in your head. So it was, that was a huge process. And it was one thought at a time. And I remember driving to work. I had like a 40 minute commute to work and I would put Eckhart Tolle on at the time I was listening to The Power of Now and some other things. And, and I would see these thoughts come through. No, no, it was a freaking chase, freaking chase. <laughs> I was so angry and it's like, okay, there's a thought. You know, how can I make this work a little bit differently? And, and the instrument of peace was really the first, the first tool. It's a paper tool. It's not uh, the, the computer bot that Spiri is, but it was the precursor of, of Spiri. And I would write, you know, I'd get to work, and the first thing I'd do, you know, I'd have my coffee before I saw anybody. It's like, okay, let's, let's get this out. And um, over time, with each each thought, it became easier and easier and easier. And I just, I can't, I can't share enough that, yes, the sole responsibility of the miracle worker is to be accept the atonement for ourselves. And believe me, you know it's working when you go, oh no, that can't be true. They are so wrong. This, this, I, I'm not taking, I'm not taking responsibility for this. You can guarantee there's a miracle in there for you, but it doesn't land like it initially. And that's where joining with mighty companions really is the ticket. And I offer you, you know, the 30 day, um, David and Living Miracles has a 30 day program on Facebook. It's free. It's offered like every month, month and a half. I moderate the Facebook group and it's like people are going deep with this program. People are taking on, <laughs> very, you know, I, people are taking on their worst nightmares and they're, they're owning them. And I just, I offer this to all of you because it's a way that you can join with your mighty companions in the unwind because you cannot do this yourself. It, you know, Jesus did, <laughs> but he, he did this whole death resurrection thing to show us we're not alone. And, and he came up with these disciples and yeah, they, you know, some of them took it a wrong turn here and there, but now we have this thing called the Course in Miracles that is really showing us how to do this. And if you don't have access to somebody in your life that can hold the space for you when you're going through it and not agree with you, and not make you wrong, but join you in the atonement, which is a real different process. And that's why I love living in community, quite frankly, because we're all kind of joined in this same thing. There's no make wrong. <laughs> There's no, you're wrong, I'm right, none of that. It's like, you just forgot. You're a holy, innocent child of God, and your thoughts are taking you somewhere else. And so that's why I offer you the 30 days. There's Spiri, there's the Instrument for Peace. Oh, there's so many things. And if you go to livingmiracles.org, you can find a whole host of resources. Many do not cost a thing. And you can, you can sign on and join them. I know we have Jeff doing movies every week. Um, so there's an entertaining way to handle this. Just really find your path and join in this process of the sole responsibility of the miracle worker is to accept the atonement for themselves. And that's what we're doing here. That's all we're doing here. There's nothing else. 
It's, you know, people say, well, wow, what happens in community? Like, woo, 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 woo. It's like, man, we're just working our butts off, <laughs> accepting the atonement and seeing where we want to make someone wrong and, and shifting that and looking at ourselves. It's like, what belief is this reflecting that I need to undo? And, and all these tools. And David is such a gift in that he kind of really took the Course of course Miracles literally and kind of developed from in all the living miracles that have, have worked on these programs for a while, have developed them from the ground up so that they're available. Spreakers and YouTubes, I just can't say enough about Spreakers and YouTubes. And I may not have a chance to go into the real nitty, because the, the superficial forgiveness opportunities are really obvious. Like, Needing to forgive Chase, that was pretty obvious. But then it gets into this subtler area. And ego is sneaky. I say there's a back door, you know, and ego is just coming in the doggy door going, I gotcha. <laughs> and it's like, you really need to watch out for these sneaky areas. And he just had a spreaker come out. Let me get the name of it so that you can go. It's a 23-minute spreaker, and it's fabulous. Um, I've got it. Oh, a lesson in freeing the mind by transcending magic thoughts. A lesson in freeing the mind by transcending magic thoughts. Now, I thought magic thoughts, and they are. Magic thoughts are that which I use from the illusion to shift something in form. Okay, that's the way I held magic. But David takes it to a whole new level. If there's something that's being projected that you want to shift, like me wanting to make Chase Manhattan wrong and just have him get off my back and leave me alone and give me my home back, this is where transcending magic thoughts really comes to play in a very subtle way because it's not on right, wrong. But I just heard something. <laughs> um, it's not about, it, it, magic thoughts are when you see someone like wearing the color green, ooh, they shouldn't wear that color green. That's a magic thought. I'm trying to shift form. But I'm trying to make it so their life works better by shifting their form. Oh my God, this is sick. I mean, this, the insanity of how deep this goes. And you can loop over and over and over and make yourself just freaking nuts. <laughs> And I highly recommend listening to that speaker. And I had to listen to it this past week about five times because there was something I was looping on, which I won't go into right now. But I was looping and I kept thinking, man, if this person would just get this piece, it would make their life so much easier. And then I could, I could relax. <laughs> and it's like, no, this is all for you. <laughs> and so it's like, just... Take it gently, okay? And that's, and that's a pretty high level of, of, you know, working with A Course in Miracles. So initially just take the obvious ones, the ones that make you angry, you know? If you're annoyed at your boss or your lover or your child or your dog, you know, take those to spirit, you know, see those differently. And, and play with the whole process of accepting the atonement. But it definitely is a verb. It's not a om, I'm at one with everything, om. You know, that lasts for as long as you're thinking, I'm at one with everything. And then as soon as the phone bill comes in and they've done something wrong, you got a call and you're on an 800 number and you want to rip someone's heart out, that's when the atonement really comes into play. <laughs> so the sole responsibility of the miracle worker is to accept the atonement for himself. This is the foundation of A Course in Miracles. This is where everything starts and stops. And uh, David has many speakers. I mean, this last one I just love because it took me to a whole new level. But he has many speakers that, and YouTubes. And they're all free. And you can just listen to them and just put them on a loop. Listen to them. And if you don't, and here's a hint from someone that really knows. I, I love tips. This is a good tip. If, when David is sharing something, you don't understand, you don't understand, it sounds like this. If it sounds like that, 
We need to loop it, okay? Keep playing it. There's something there for you to get, and it needs to, it needs to go deep, and you have some resistance up in your face that's preventing you from hearing it. That's all. So play it over and over and over. And I've done this so many times with David's stuff. I can't even tell you. Um, and this last speaker was a huge chunk for me because we're just all clearing this together. If we're here in the illusion, we believe in bodies or else we wouldn't be here. And I just, you know, it's like, just take heart. You're not alone. And there's a lot of us joining together in this process at this point. You can find you can find help. You can find mighty companions to do this with. You don't have to do this on your own. So um, let me just, I have a little Rooney quote. I love Rooney. Um, he quiets my mind, which is not an easy thing to do. Um, and this is, this is about hit Rooney's take on accepting the atonement. The fault is in the blamer. Spirit sees nothing to criticize. Yeah, so, you know, the next time you may find yourself having a thought run by your head going, hmm, not a good color on them. You know, just remember, the fault is in the blamer. The spirit sees nothing to criticize. Yeah. So we're getting close to the end of the show. And I just want to say, stay tuned to LM Virtual today because we have a whole series of programs, good good juicy programs for you to um, join together. We have a whole Sunday worth of enlightening material to, to kind of shine some light on the awakening process. And, uh, you know, Living Miracles is a, an incredible um, opportunity to, to join. And Sundays, we're kind of giving you our day. So, um, I do want to end with a quote that I started with in the last program. And, uh, and I'm not always going to be the only one on these programs. I just need to say it's just the guidance was go for the groundwork, which is the sole responsibility of the miracle worker is to accept the atonement for himself. <laughs> and then this is one of my favorite pieces and where the beyond the body kind of came from. It's, it's one of the obstacles to peace in A Course in Miracles. Yet would I offer you my body, you whom I love, knowing its littleness? Or would I teach that bodies cannot keep us apart? Mine was of no greater value than yours, no better means for communication of salvation but not its source. No one can die for anyone, and death does not atone for sin. But you can live to show it is not real. The body does appear to be the symbol of sin while you believe that it can get you what you want, while you believe that it can give you pleasure. You will also believe that it can bring you pain. To think you could be satisfied and happy with so little is to hurt yourself, and to limit the happiness that you would have calls upon pain to fill your meager store and make your life complete. This is completion as the ego sees it, for guilt creeps in where happiness has been removed and substitutes for it. Communion is another kind of completion which goes beyond guilt because it goes beyond the body. Bye, you guys. Until next couple weeks. <laughs> it was just a tiny moment at which the Son of God remembered not to laugh. We built an altar made of hate and fear. We let the ego live.
Okay. Well, thank you so much, Calico. And uh, we have uh, another show coming up soon. So in 15 minutes time, we're going to have Access Miracles with uh, Dan and Marie and their special guest, Kristen. So join us in 15 minutes. Bye. We have uh, Dan and Marie with their show, Access Miracles, and talking to Kristen Marcoux. So I'll cross live to Dan and Marie now. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. You are tuned in to Access Miracles. Yes, and um, we're actually really, really excited that our first guest is one of the producers, for lack of a better word, of Living Miracles, uh, Ellen Virtual TV, and her name is Kristen Marcou. So as part of our anchor for our shows, we would like to actually discuss each miracle principle, and there's 50 of them. And today's show is anchored on the first principle of miracles. First principle is, there is no order of difficulty in miracles. One is not harder or bigger than another. They're all the same. And all expressions of love are maximal. Yes, yeah, so... I'm actually, I'd like to introduce Kristen from the perspective of how I got to meet her for the first time, which was miraculous. We met at the FIP fundraiser last year, and um, she was actually just supposed to pass by. She was going to help volunteer. And as we were doing function together, cleaning and organizing for the event, um, one day, we were in the gathering room waiting for other people to come together because we were going to have a meeting. And um, I was really in this space of just peace and contentment. And as I was waiting, I dropped into a meditative space. And I sat on the love seat waiting, just really filled with such love in the silence. And as I happened to look across... Christian, with her blue eyes, looked at me, and somehow she knew, and I was already in the space of such love and contentment. She stood up from her meditation spot, and she climbed into my lap, and I got to hold her, and we, I, I can't even explain to you, it was, it was this higher love, this higher love. So when I think about... <laughs> this first principle, there's no order of difficulty in miracles. That to me was, was miraculous that she could see where I was and she joined me in that space and it was just glorious. So, um, you know, since that time, uh, she's done a lot of other things and we've been joining together and coming together for meetings, for preparing the show and there's been a lot of healing as well. And it's been really profound. But I will give the floor to Dan as he asks. Well, no, actually, let me introduce her now. <laughs> We're very honored, very grateful to share Kristen Marco and the parable of what it's like before and after community being in here. Kristen? Yeah, thank you for having me. It's a real honor, actually, just to be able to share and like there's so much that seems to happen behind the scenes of these shows that um, like what you see is just what happens on camera, but there's, there's just so much heart and care that goes into it. And that's, that was part of my inspiration for just being a part of these shows was to just really as a way and the reflection of supporting the, the vibrancy and the expansion in my own mind is just to really support my brothers. And, and so, yeah, I just feel like it's a really amazing time right now. And I'm just, yeah, I'm really honored to be here and just offer whatever is is there. That's great. Okay, so here we go, yeah. Dan. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, you came. I I was already uh, at La Casa in uh, in Chapala, Mexico, when you arrived, and um, I hadn't met you before. And I found out um, actually that you had been in community and then you had left and then come back. And so uh, my first question is, 
um, what was the, the, the impetus for leaving and then coming back and, and then, uh, and what were the changes that occurred during that time for you? Yeah, thank you. It was, it was what felt like huge milestones or turning points in my life. So I was with the Living Miracles community just as, you know, the very, the, the very natural way that the spirit drops you into some place that you really love. And I was there for about a year and a half. And, and like I said, like, there's just so much healing that goes on behind the scenes of these shows and like just every day, like it's our life. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Every moment where the opportunity is, how do I feel? And raising up what you can to get back to the clarity and the joy. <coughs> and I discovered that I was seemingly being given everything that I was asking for. And there was still some kind of block in my mind. And when I really got in touch with that, I discovered I had these other desires. Like I, I really wanted, basically, I wanted things that I felt the spirit wasn't offering. And it was just my perspective. And what the spirit offered as a gentler way for me to start moving through those blocks was to try something else. So, yeah, we, we just prayed together, a few of us, and... Um, just got really clear on what it was that I wanted. Like it was so beautiful and gentle. And from there, I, I just took a leap of faith and I went from small town Camas, which is the population of like, I don't even know, so small. And I landed in San Francisco and it was just this huge, huge, um, huge change in my life. And it just brought up tons of stuff that it gave me an opportunity to to continue looking at the blocks, like nothing, nothing really changed, actually, if I'm honest, like, there's just a feeling in, in your heart that when you're part of the shared purpose like this, that never changes. It's, in my mind, it just felt like, well, I, I need to go at a, a different pace or something. Like, you know, it was just what the spirit offered. And it looked different than what I was used to for the last year and a half. And um, yeah, it was, I could, I could just feel how guided it was, because I would I was having these crazy experiences walking around San Francisco, feeling pretty shaken up. Like what just happened? Cause it was fairly swift as well. Spirit, the spirit just carried me there very swiftly and I'd walk around and I had this commitment idea in mind, commit, commit, commit. What does that even mean? And, and I discovered that it slowly <laughs> over my time there in San Francisco, um, that it was committing to the spirit, like just making a decision to really go for it. It didn't have anything to do with committing to, like a, an organization or a job had dropped in for me pretty immediately or anything like that. I was just committing to continue moving in the direction of clarity and peace of mind, full stop. Mm -hmm. And I would have these experiences. I'd walk around San Francisco and there would be this huge sign like engraved in stone on this big building, like commit to something. <laughs> <laughs> it was bizarre. So that was, that was what my journey was um, when I, when I seemingly left and just went to do some other things. It was really like the spirit just used what it could to reach me because I felt like I was stuck. Yeah. And um, yeah, I just, I had the most amazing miracles too. Like I was, I was there and out and about. And after San Francisco, I was in Hawaii at a place called Kalani for a little while. And then I did some traveling after that, like some road tripping. And the spirit gave me all of these assignments, like like there was still so much communication happening that there's a sameness in the experience of being in living miracles and community and then suddenly being somewhere else. So, but yeah, I had these assignments to basically take care of all of my whims, which was so bizarre. Um, so like I got tattoos within the first, like the first few weeks of, of leaving and um, it was given me to travel. I worked for this adventure travel company and um just had these really amazing miracles there because it was the same thing. Like I just heard Jesus very clearly in my mind one day as I was sitting, I was sitting in training at a job and I was like, you have got to be kidding me. Like you give me a job. Like, no, this is, mo I'm moving backwards. Like I had all of these judgments about the way that it looked tons, tons. Mm -hmm. And, um, so I just heard very clearly, like you need to pour your heart into this. Mm -hmm. Like I, it was so clear and I just, that carried me for such a long time. And so I just did that. I mean, my boss at the time was asking me, are you going to commit to this? And so finally I was just like, yes, <laughs> I think I have to. And um, 
yeah, I, I got to like play out a lot of my whims there too. Like I traveled across the country twice and just met this amazing group of people. And I just, I experienced something like a rolling community. I lived on a bus for 30 days and traveled across the country. And really there's just too many miracles to name. It was so deep and profound. And when do you think you started, when do you think you started actually recognizing that you were hearing spirit as opposed to, oh, this is just a, a, a passing thought or I know that in my life I didn't really recognize these intuitive thoughts were from spirit. There were times when it was like, wow, that's, that's pretty strong, but most of the time not. So was this something new for you or did, had you already been experiencing that before you even came into community? It's cool that you say that because I feel like whenever I can look back at any time in my life, if I'm really looking, I will find the places where the spirit tried to reach me mm -hmm. in a song or in uh, uh, somebody like I had um, a mentor from a very young age who was, you know, just like your, your typical old wise man. I'd sit at the back of the room and watch everybody with him. And he would just ask me questions like, is a bird still a bird if it's in a cage? And I'd mm -hmm. be like, you know, my mind would just <laughs> be alone. Blown. So I feel like the spirit's always trying to reach us and it's really just if we're open or not. Yeah. And then just the process, my experience has just been how much more can I allow the spirit to reach me just continuously. Yeah. And I, I just feel to mention that when, um, when you arrived at uh, the monastery in Utah, it was remarkable to me because how you just, it's almost, it was so it's like you landed like a feather and you fit right in with everything that was going on. I, you just felt like you were always there. It was amazing to me, this experience of watching you like in form, I could see like your body and everything. And I didn't see you before when I was there. And then one day you were there and you just felt like you were always there. That was the experience I had of you when you landed in, yeah, during the, the, the time for preparation for the fundraiser. And I thought it was so beautiful. Like for me, the experience was just watching and seeing like, yeah, it's never about the form, is it? It's about the feeling. And I could feel you were always there, but your body wasn't there. It was, it was really remarkable. Yeah, that was part of the gift of me seemingly going away. I got to see the sameness. Like when I was having, I was actually on that bus trip driving through a canyon in Utah. I was sitting on an upside down toolbox in the front of a bus. <laughs> And I was driving through the canyons of Utah and I just started to cry. Like I just had this massive wash because I could feel like the spirit was in my mind telling me, this is why you had to go. You had to see that it's the same. Like you can experience that feeling right. wherever you are. So it, it was very important for me. It was a very important time of just like, you know, letting the specialness come up and all the thoughts of like, I can't do what I did there because I'm not there. It was, it was very intense when I was believing those thoughts and, it was some unwinding because there was an attachment to that. And, and then so beautifully, like you just said, Marie, like I did not plan to be at FIP at the monastery any longer than two days. I didn't, I had this feeling like I was going to go there. Like I was traveling closer and closer to Utah. And I was like, I hope, I hope. <laughs> Cause I just felt such love. And like, there's, there's something there, you know, a real, real resonance with what's happening here. So I just had this whim to come back and just drop in and see everyone and how can I support. And so I was in the Grand Tetons one night and um, I was planning to go drive clear through to Massachusetts, which is where I was born. And I had some plans there that I was going to carry out. And I, I think I texted Nicholas actually. And I was like, okay, yeah, I think, I think I could be there tomorrow if you need some help. And he just immediately was on the phone. I was like pacing. I was having this huge reaction, <laughs> but um, he was like, yeah, you know, you can come. And I think it was Jason and Susanna called me and they were like, yeah, come and come and support. And I was like, okay, well, I was traveling with somebody else at the time. And he was, you know, we were together and pretty involved in, um, or like what's the words, he was into the teachings enough, not into the course, but into the teachings enough that we could really connect. And so he was like, yeah, you know, I'll try it out. And so we landed there and yeah, it was going to be for two days. And after that, I remember, remember somebody saying, Oh, we're all going to Mexico. And I just, I just broke when I started hearing that, like, I can't leave. What am I doing? Yeah. yeah. Can't leave. It's here. Like, this is where my heart lives right um, now. Yeah. Well, and it's obvious. Um, apparently, <clears throat> uh, 
uh, not long ago, you were walking along the lakefront uh, called the Malikon here in Chapala, and you broke out into a song of Alleluia. Uh, what was <laughs> with that? <laughs> I knew he was going to ask me that, and I still laugh. <laughs> yeah, I feel like this time, we're in this really beautiful expansion time, and extension, extend, extend, is a way of lifting yourself. And I feel very inspired by that lately. That's why my hand went up for these shows initially, because it was like, I want to be the, I want to be involved in that. That feels amazing. And so, yeah, I was walking along the Malcom with someone else, and and I can't remember how it happened, actually. I was in conversation. I was walking with Michael, and we were just at, like, this really picturesque spot, and I just started, we were sitting together, and I was humming, I think, and he said, oh, do you want to go sing it? And I was like, no. <laughs> yes. No. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, and so, I don't know, I just, like, I, I, it's such a, a fun, like, I keep using this word, thrilling. It's so thrilling for me lately to just keep jumping, like, just do it, just do it. So I was like, well, I'll just try it and see what happens. And so there, yeah, there I stood at the edge of the Malacan, like, uh, towards the water and just yeah. sang. And I mean, it was, I was like, this after a little bit, like, which just happened. But I love that experience because it, it shows me something David said yesterday, like it just shows you that you're limitless. Like you can just keep pushing the edges of what, what you think you're allowed to do or what you think you can do. And yeah. I just feel really inspired by that lately, like the vulnerability and just being really raw. It's like, I just get to continue falling in love with what's happening. Yeah, you know, I think I want to go back and just really i like when you said that it was very gentle and how you felt called to come in you felt the guidance also to go out because there were still some things you wanted and then you came in again when you felt that guidance too i think that's my experience too and what i want to share with everyone is that you know there's no forcing there's no anything you can feel it. it's like a breeze that comes in and or you can I don't know. It's like you can smell it. It's like it's in there and you just keep following that. Um, I also really am moved when you told me that one of the reasons you felt you had to leave was that you didn't want to believe that this place was special, that this was the only place you could find awakening, that this was the only place you could feel God, hear God, talk to God. I think I want everybody to really get that, that you know, when you're called to be where you are, you know, God is always there. And the fact that you were so committed that this place, so-called place, be not that special, I, I thought, that is so beautiful, Kristen, that you did that and you followed the guidance. You didn't get stuck with the form and said, it has to be here. It must be here and it's only here. And then I never knew that parable of what you went through with San Francisco, and it just is glorious. And I think that's just, you know, for everyone to really be present to that it is that gentle, it is that beautiful, it is that loving. Yeah, I am. Um, <clears throat> another thing I noticed about you that um, was, I think, for me, an inspiration was that you seem to be driven by something that is actually an enthusiasm and an inspiration and a, a way of sharing that we all pick up on. And uh, you pass that on to us. And um, in particular about the show, about extending like we're doing now. And... Um, <clears throat> I wondered, is there, a, uh, is there anything in particular that, that, that has brought this on in you? Is it, a, is it an experience that, have you always been this enthusiastic about things, or is this just something that we've inspired in you? <laughs> I don't know if I've always been this enthusiastic. Maybe. Uh, I think it always has lived there. Like I just, like I said, at least lately, like, I just feel so, oh, like so 
like there's a, such a fullness and a richness in my heart and just this leaning into it with all of this extension and like just letting it be really raw and vulnerable. Like the miracles have started to build the trust enough that I can continue and, you know, take maybe seemingly bigger leaps of faith. Like we were sitting in a gathering the other night and somebody said, Peter, Peter said, Kristen's got a song. And I was like, what? <laughs> so do you want to come sing it in front of the group? And I was like, yeah, I do. <laughs> it's just that feeling of like, oh, I'm just going to go for it and yeah. see what happens. And then, cause when I keep doing that, like, this is where the enthusiasm comes in. I just like, I feel like I just want to share this with everybody. Cause it's like a roller coaster ride. Like you're, it's like, I don't know, maybe more like skydiving or something, mm -hmm. you know, like not maybe the ups and downs of the roller yeah. coaster, but just like, just do it. Yeah. Just jump. I feel really inspired by that. And I don't know if it's just cause you know, that's my healing and like maybe a shyness and stuff early on in my life, but I just am really inspired by that. And so that's the vibrancy and the expansion. I just, I can't help but share that cause it's so, I just want to spread it, you know? Well, is that something spread you can, it everywhere. Is that something you can like encourage our audience to, with? You know, I mean, really. <laughs> Take the leap, whatever it is, is what you've been thinking doing, about. Right? Doing. You've got this life and we are hearing spirit and spirit is saying, yeah, go for it. Be free. And so um, it yeah. takes all kinds of different forms, right? Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, I think that, that I sat in, in, a, in a place where I was kind of, I felt like, oh, I really needed to extend. And, and I did some of that. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, I never got up in front of a, a lakefront group of people and went, hey, listen to this. <laughs> no, that didn't happen. But why not? You know, this is great. I think I think everybody's inspired out here to to do something, to move beyond what appear to be limits, right? Yeah, that's a really good point. I mean, you know, because I think everybody has that inspiration inside them, and it's that tickle. It's that thing that when you keep doing it, you just feel happier. You just feel like, oh, that's my real self. That that makes me smile, or that makes me feel connected, or that makes me feel happy. I think that, you know, we don't, nobody can tell us what that is. We just kind of have to keep feeling it. I, I have been quoting Francis Zhu a lot in terms of, you know, what this journey has been like. How did I end up in community? And your parable, what you just shared, reminds me of it too, Kristen. It's like, you know, you end up here or you end up where you are because you just keep following that inspiration. And you can end up doing what you're doing and being guided to where you are because what happens is that inspiration becomes greater than the fear. And it's really recognizing that inspiration for you. You heard it like, I feel this and I want to follow that, you know, in that joy, following those little like crumbs of joy that's being provided. If, if we're really listening, if we're really allowing ourselves to go and experience it. Right, Kristen? Yeah, it's really cool too, just talking about the leaps of faith. Because I was just, as you're talking, just even sitting here praying into it, it feels it feels like the, the inspiration and that kind of like, oh, I'm going to jump again, comes from this really quiet place inside. Like it doesn't come from this place of compulsive, like I'm just going to do something for the sake of doing it. It's like somebody will ask or offer just like a suggestion. And then there's this feeling of like, oh, <laughs> okay, let's do this. So I just feel to share that because it's like, there's nothing you actually need to do. It's just like being really present with the way that you're feeling. And then when a prompt comes in, like just entertaining them. How does that feel? Oh, yeah, it feels kind of good. Let's see what happens. Yeah, that was a, actually something that just uh, occurred uh, with us the other day. Uh, Marie is, is really very sensitive to that, how do you feel? And, and <clears throat> I actually had the experience where I woke up in the morning and was like, yeah, I don't know, what's going on today? And then it was, she had mentioned, look into your feelings. How do you feel? And as soon as I did that, um, that there was a release and it was very helpful. And I, I trusted that, that, that this is a question that needs to be asked and, and you can listen because spirits, they're talking to us the whole time. I did have another question for you. Fire away. Okay. So can you express how you feel 
now relative to how you felt a year ago and where you think you'll be in another year. <laughs> Let's see. Hmm. I feel like it's, hmm, I don't actually know that I can pinpoint years like based yeah. on dates and where I was or anything like that, but it's more like, I feel like there's more of an allowance in my mind to let the spirit work with me mm -hmm. and to just be listening and following, following perhaps more swiftly. Mm -hmm. And yeah, just really moving through the blocks be because I'm here in this context with all of us that are really committed to moving through things very swiftly and, you know, like bring it up, bring it up, bring it up. Mm -hmm. There's even more things happening. Um, so there's more joy and this vibrancy can come through and all of that. So I would say there's a difference in that. Mm -hmm. But it's not that that wasn't there before either. It's just more like just this just this continuing of an opening, like a flower that just continues to bloom. Yeah. Yeah. I hear when you say that, I hear it's very musical. It's very musical. And she's a dance person, just so you know. So <laughs> I can feel that she, that's, that's how spirit reaches you. It's like this movement mm. and just trusting that movement. So beautiful, Kristen. Mm. Yeah, thank you guys so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. And thank you everyone for being with us. And uh, hi. <laughs> Love you guys and being here and accessing the miracles. It's great to see your smiling faces. Yes. And, um, and yeah. this has really been fun. Um, we'll continue on with this. Uh, there have mm -hmm. been a couple of schedule changes, but we're supposed to be back here April 1st. Mm -hmm. about the same time 10 45 our time and um so thank you so much for joining us and uh it's it's been an inspiration thank miracles you, are guys. our inheritance <laughs> oh wow okay thank you guys that was so beautiful <laughs> um Great. So now, uh, another 15 minutes time, we have another show coming up. Um, we have Come Into the Light with Anne. So stay tuned. We'll be back. because um, like the depth of uh, causation is that mind is causative and and so even though music can have such a profound seemingly such a profound effect on us it stirs up emotion it stirs up memory uh, and she's asked me to read a little bit to just help you get to know them so here we go I'd like to introduce everyone to Anne and the three people being interviewed by her today from Sweden, Sylvia, Thomas, and Iwa Britt. They have come together in translating projects for the common purpose of awakening. Sylvia came to the course in February of 2014 when her friend came by one day with a book. It was A Course in Miracles, and she soon realized this was the book she'd been waiting for all her life. She found Living Miracles soon after and attended a retreat in Stockholm with David, with David. It was there she realized that David was her teacher. He didn't try to pretty up the journey. He was honest, uncompromising, and direct, which she liked. Sylvia later went for a devotional stay in, stay, devotional stay in Spain to translate and met Anne. Sylvia's husband, Thomas, came to the course through Sylvia, and they study it together. When Sylvia started translating one of David's books into Swedish, he thought, oh, what a great job, and nothing more. After a while, he wanted to read a new book and thought, why not proofread Sylvia's translation? And so their journey together into the project began. Ewa Brett found her course book in 2003, which she had bought, bought in the 1980s. She felt she'd come to an end of a road leading nowhere, was depressed and very low. When she finally opened the book, it was like opening a treasure chest and an answer to a deep prayer. 
Quite unexpectedly, she then met an old friend and told her she was reading the course. Her friend started to cry with joy and exclaimed, that was her path, her life, and Iwa Brett had met her first mighty companion. Her journey with living miracles began in 2008 at a retreat with David and Jenny, which was life-changing. Her two sisters saw Iwa Brett's transformation and started to study the course too. Back then, she translated one of David's books, A Glimpse of Grace, and when Anne asked her about proofreading, she felt the joy to say yes to collaborating with Sylvia and Thomas. She felt lifted into a new big wave, into the unknown. Take it away, Anne. Oh. Take it away. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, you're not going to end just yet. We've got this beautiful introductory song with Emily and Susanna. That's where you're going. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Uh, yeah, just before we sing this song, I just wanted to share where it came from. It's Calls Come Into the Light, fitting for Anne's show. And um, actually, Anne asked us if we would be able to um, sing something original on her show. So Susanna and I came together and we said, well, let's just improvise and see what happens. And this song came out of it. So it's the first song that we've, yeah, that's come through us together. So feels beautiful to share it. We shared it last week, but to share it with you again this week. everyone um, thank you so much for the song that was beautiful and um, yeah very warm welcome to my guests today Thomas uh, Sylvia and you are Brit and I'm going to get straight to asking you questions because yeah hopefully we'll get through them all we'll see yeah for our viewers can you tell them 
how projects you know that you found expiring uh, expiring inspiring even <laughs> <laughs> maybe it's expiring who knows is beneficial for your awakening <laughs> and uh, i don't know who wants to speak about that first <laughs> Well, I, I can say uh, I have a fellow joy in the project, and I have a chance to joy in my daily life. But more and more, I have de development the possibility to follow the Holy, Spirit, Holy Spirit's guidance, and that's the most important part of the, how the project has inspired me. They think the whole project has definitely sped up my awakening. And for me, I can, I can say. Okay, carry on, you, Brett. <laughs> yes, I just want to say that it was such a help that you came in with that question from Spain when you and Sylvia were together. I hear myself in the echo, but I don't know. Um, so it was so beautiful to have the opportunity to come in and proofread together with Thomas and Sylvia. Thank you. Sylvia, I met you at your devotional stay in Spain. And that's where we practice no people pleasing, no private thoughts and we did expression sessions. Uh, were you able to bring any of those things home and practice with Thomas? Yes, <laughs> I really did that. Um, when I started to um, uh, do the translations, I started with quantum forgiveness. And at that time, uh, I hadn't learned no people pleasing and no private thoughts. Uh, so it was a bit of a struggle for us <laughs> to work together. But then I went to Spain and I learned it and I came home and I learned Thomas <laughs> how to do it. And we, it's such a difference, such a huge difference, uh, how we collaborate after that. We feel uh, more respect for each other and we have a calmer life together, laughing at our different perceptions. perceptions. Uh, and we feel we, we are working for the whole. So, Yes, a huge difference with using those tools. Thank you. Um, when you're actually working on the translation project, um, yeah, how does it work? Does it help to settle your mind? What are the benefits, really, you know, that you can call to mind? Uh, for me, it, is a, it's, it has been a, a very big help for um, especially, I noticed it when I translated I Married the Mystic, um, because when I translate, uh, just in the moment I translate the words, it has been answers for the struggles I'm in right at that moment. So it was so good timing for, from the spirit uh, all the time. It was a blessing. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, you mentioned that you, you when I spoke to you about the difference between uh, translating quantum forgiveness and I married a mystic. Do you want to just tell us a little bit about that? Uh, yes, quantum forgiveness gave me a much deeper understanding for for the of course for of course in miracles. 
and I also realized that the movies were very helpful uh, in bringing up the very deep, very buried feelings I had and release them from my mind. Um, <clears throat> I married a mystic. I uh, has give, given me um, a tools to how I can bring the course, uh, uh, a course in miracles, into my daily life. Um, there's so many tools in that book that how to how I can settle my mind, uh, daily routines, uh, how to start my day. Uh, how can I have a better contact with the Holy Spirit and uh, developing the trust for what I feel and hear? Beautiful, Sylvia. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I interrupted you. Wondering if you had anything to add, Thomas, or you were Brett. It's okay if not. I can move on to another question. <laughs> I just can agree. Time of forgiveness gave me too a, a better understanding of the Course in Miracle. But uh, I made a mystical more useful, had been more useful for me in the daily life. So I have the same experience in Sylvia. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, um, this is a question really for Sylvia. When I spoke to you about the interview, um, you said that the experience of translating and proofreading with Thomas has brought you from a very special type of relation into a more holy or the beginnings of a more holy relationship and that just felt really beautiful when you were telling me about it and um, yeah I wonder if you can expand on that tell me a little bit about the changes that have occurred in your relationship yes <laughs> um, at first I think we we just stopped to project things, feelings on each other uh, and um, we have developed a much deeper respect for the other person. We are more tuning in and listening to what the other, what, what the other people are saying. Uh, we don't judge each, each other for saying or thinking or having other opinions and when something goes wrong as you call it uh, we often laugh um, <clears throat> and that wasn't the case before <laughs> so and uh, yeah and not so much feeling of, of pride uh, oh i can't say i was wrong uh, it, it, it's just my pride. I want to keep my pride. Now uh, we we can both say, "Oh, that was wrong. I had wrong," and it feels so good. Mm. Yeah, I can feel it. That's beautiful. Um, yeah, this is a question that I'm going to direct towards you, or Brett. Um, there were a few unexpected challenges that were coming through Living Miracles with the projects. And the first one was that the guidance came through that we'd no longer be publishing the books, the translations, but placing them for free on the European website. And yeah, you were Brett, I just want to ask you, what were your thoughts around this? Well, uh, I felt joy when I heard it, like, um, because when I met David, you know, freely you have received, now freely give. It was one of the first things that he wanted to just give uh, and uh, to extend in a way that everyone is invited and has the opportunity. And um, so, and 
I have translated one book before that became a book, a transcribed it with a mighty companion. And then I, I, think, I think we wanted to have our names, so we had our names, but this time I had no feeling of that because I was like the third leg on a tripod. Uh, so I had no expectations and um, but I could see you now when it came up that it was very interesting to see uh, that with no expectations. It's a, a lesson and a gift every time when the question is, comes up to see what is my feeling around it. So it was very beautiful that we had, we was uh, asked to, and we shared about this. Thank you, you were Brett. And this is directed to Sylvia, because I know that you had some stuff to work through around this, Sylvia. Uh, and it was around the desire to actually have your names in um, the translation, in the translated book. And um, yeah, can you talk a little bit about your feelings that came up around that? And how you decided in the end that you didn't actually need or want that recognition? Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> Um, I always felt that doing the job, translating, and uh, it, it takes a lot of time, but it was just a joy to give my time to the project. Uh, but when it came to the names, I had slightly different feelings. It really hurt my pride. <laughs> Here we go again with the pride. Um, so I, I just had to look very deep into that. What, from where did it come? Why did I feel like that? And um, I realized it was the ego in me that wanted to show off and I could then see that it was a perfect gift from the spirit to me to look at uh, this. So therefore, no names. Okay, yeah. thank you. And I'd just like to add to that, that you could have actually put your names into the book. Nobody was saying you couldn't, but you actually came to that yourselves. Um, yeah. Okay, I'm directing this question at uh, Thomas, I know that, um, yeah, there were a few obstacles that came up for you when you started to work on the, um, on the project, you know, you were doing the, the first part of the proofreading and there were some things that you felt you needed to correct in the translation. There was a little bit of fear around speaking with Sylvia. Oh yes, it was a lot of feeling that turned out. <laughs> The first one was fear, and fear of don't be good enough to, to proofread. Don't understand the message and don't get the, the Swedish grammar in a correct way. So that's the first one I had to look through. Next one was actually guilt. I looked for faulties. When everything was good, I didn't say anything, but when I found something was wrong, I <laughs> have to try to tell her. So, in a way, I felt guilt for just looking for problems. And the third thing was attack feelings. When I was to tell Sylvia, she has, in my opinion, translated long. It's easy to say, I'm better than you. I found the wrong things you have done. So, I have to look at my the, the ego way you wanted to attack her. Uh, and then and I have coped with that one, fear came back. There I tell Sylvia, <laughs> is she gonna be mad at me? <laughs> so I have to, to look at fear again. And then I found out the best thing to approach it is to say what I think. And don't say what I think, it's people pleasing. If I say to Sylvia, that's good, and I don't mean it, it's really people pleasing, and that's I have to learn not to do. So this also a lesson for me. So very much that came up in the beginning. Yes, yes. 
Thank you for sharing that, Thomas. And it sounds like you're having a great washing of all those people pleasing things. And <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, you also mentioned that you like there was a difference between reading a book and proofreading a book. And yeah, I wondered if you wanted to just tell us a little bit about that. Yes, for me, when I when I read a book, I just read it through, and if I get the message, I do. If I don't, I don't understand. I didn't. But when I proofread, I read it several times. I want to get the message correct, so I I step into the context in a way, be a part of the book, and then I started to compare the way the book looks at the word to my own, and then I started to change my way of looking at the word. So it's, it's transferred my way of looking at the word, the, the perception of everything that happened. So it's very good. It's very, very good, very helpful for me to, to be in the project. Thank you, Thomas. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, you also talked a little bit to me about, um, yeah, you know, like the, the transfer of training, really, you know, like it was like you were focusing in on a particular project, but how that affected your life in a wider way as well. Ooh, I have been taking the experience from being the product into the real world, <laughs> so to speak. <laughs> Um, I found when I in the project, I'm, it's very fun to to do it, and it has given me a lot of inner peace. And I also found that time just disappeared. And I, for example, I take it to my daily life. And for example, when I go to the grocery store, and you you have two queues, and you choose the wrong one. Before I was angry. How could I choose the wrong one? Now I just choose one, don't think why, stand there, look at the people around, and it, if it takes two minutes or five minutes, who cares, it's nice to just go up to the people and look at them and smile at them. That's beautiful, that's the miracle, isn't it? The complete change in perspective on that. Thank you. Um, yeah. Um, Sylvia and Thomas, you've just moved very recently, a couple of weeks ago, um, to a new location. Um, you felt very prompted by spirit to move, even though it meant leaving your work, Thomas, your family, your friends. So how is that working out for you? Oh, it's uh, a step a bit back. It started with a, a prompt. A broker came to look at the house and wanted to sell it. And we said, of course, you can look at it. We're not going to move. It take half an hour and half, an, half a year. And we get a prompt to look at apartments 500 kilometers away from our house. And we both looked at it and found the same apartment. And we said, okay, we're going to move there. So we bought it without seeing it. The Holy Spirit say you're going to move, so we are moving. <laughs> and we there no problems with moving. We love to live here. And the funny thing, the the, the the connection with the relatives have been better since we moved. Beautiful. Yeah. Very guided. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, you were Brit. Um, yeah, uh, Thomas had to release a lot of people pleasing and no private thoughts. And yeah, you being the, the third leg on the tripod, um, I wonder how it felt for you because you're not only correcting Sylvia, it's, it's Thomas as well. Yeah. So, how's that been? The funny thing is, I didn't, I wasn't aware that Thomas was in it in this way because it was been with Sylvia, you know, so we have been connecting and I knew that Thomas had looked at it, but um, yeah, 
I haven't felt a fear against the, correcting the two of them, but of course it is quite a new relationship with Lydia and coming and correcting and changing things that she has translated. So, but I felt it was so much joy from the beginning. With it, how it came in, it has felt like yeah, a trust and a joy. And then we have found a way to listen together. So when I have made some changes and then we are reading, I'm reading the book out loud when we connect and we're listening and, and I, I suggest the changes and it has been very smooth in a way to work like that. But of course I can see that it's a, a bit of a fear, but we can express it many times when we feel if it comes up a figure, I can express it and share it and we are looking at things in that way together. So that's so beautiful to have an opportunity. It's like an expression session also being in this function together. So very helpful for me. Thank you. Yeah, I was going to ask you how it's helping with the mind training, but you're kind of answering that already. I don't know if you've got anything to add. I think it's so beautiful. For me, it has been a very beautiful way to connect and to be in relationship and also have a joint purpose, having something uh, to work with and uh, at the same time getting to know each other better and trust more to express. And, uh, you were great, thank you. I had a few more questions for you. Uh, but we're actually about two minutes away from the end um, of the interview, so I'm just going to jump quickly to the last question, which is, um, yeah, you were, you found out quite recently that you and Sylvia uh, are going to go on a new uh, adventure together, so I just want to invite both of you to just say a little bit something about that before we end. And as well just to say thank you to all three of you for a wonderful interview and for your openness and honesty in all that you've shared it's been very beautiful thank you, so thank you carry on. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I signed up for the tabula rasa school uh, and um, i didn't know that sylvia also signed up so when we shared about it in our Zoom group, she said that she had done it. And that was a miracle. It, it feels so beautiful. It just came in very quick. <laughs> yes, it, it's lovely to have the opportunity to do this together with you, Eva Britt. Mm. I just love it. Looking forward to it with joy and love. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Again, thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, that brings us to the end of the interview. Thank you. Um, much love to everyone. <laughs> thank you so much, Anne. And thank you to your guests as well. It's so beautiful to hear what goes on behind the translating of the materials and how the healing kind of spreads out from just working with these materials in such a guided way so yeah. thanks again um we are going to have another 15 minute break and um then we are going to go with uh emily with her song of prayer uh show so uh join us again in 15 minutes in the studio with us so uh take away emily with we have the song of prayer here we go. Hi everyone, welcome. Yeah, it feels great to be here with you all today. And I just thought I'd begin with sharing a little bit about my inspiration for even why I want to do this show. And it's really um, an opportunity for me to, in an authentic way, just share you know, every time I have a show, what's, what's present for me and what my own healing is and what are the themes that are coming up. 
So, yeah, I, I think it's, it's just a great way for me to be able to keep the miracle in awareness by extending it and sharing it. And at the same time, just being very transparent and open with my journey and everything that's happening. Um, I also feel like it's an opportunity for me to have guests on the show and um, to go into specific themes that are inspiring to me and I feel would also be inspiring to all of you. Some things that it's just great to go into in a deeper way. And with that in mind, um, the theme today is actually going to be music and how music can be a pathway to God and how the spirit can really use it for healing and for forgiveness. Um, my special guest on the show today is Netta Boyne, who I'm going to be introducing shortly. But before that, I would just like to share a little bit about my, my own journey with um, how the Spirit has used music in my life and, um, yeah, just all the healing that has happened for me with that. Yeah, the Course is really a pathway of handing everything over to the Spirit, you know, um, surrendering all of our skills and all of our abilities to be used by Him for healing. And um, music in and of itself isn't special in any way. Um, nothing in form is. It's all neutral. So whether it be music or art or dancing, it doesn't really matter. But what is important is the purpose that's underneath. And everything in form can be used either by the ego or by the spirit. And the ego can use music as well. It can use it to maintain, maintain a self-concept um, for pride, for control, um, yeah, for, for, uh, to keep the egoic thought system in place. But when handed over to the spirit, the uh, music can actually be used for the opposite, to, to undo the self-concept, for forgiveness, for healing, for allowing the blocks in the mind to come up, to be released. So yeah, with that in mind, I, I just thought I would share a little bit about my own journey. And yeah, I, before I found A Course in Miracles and came to live with the Living Miracles community, I was pursuing a career as an opera singer and um, I studied in university for a number of years, got my degree in music and then I moved to Italy where I continued to, to study over there and began to, to go in the direction of launching my career. And although music was always something that was very natural for me, you know, as a child I would I would love to sing. It, it actually felt involuntary. There was just, just this joy with wanting to sing and dance all the time. When I started to go in the direction of m making it my career, it was like the ego got in there too and, and hijacked it. And it started to become about something very different than the purity it had been before. You know, before there was just like this passion and joy. And it, but it, it started to, to transfer into into something else and when there were ideas there of I need to be successful so I can survive I can make a living out of this and um, it started to become very heavy for me um, competition thoughts started to come in um, perfectionism a lot of judgment on on th my this body and this voice and judgment on other bodies and other voices voices and how it all how I compared with them and was I better or was I worse would I get the audition and um, yeah it, it got to the point where I started to experience a lot of anxiety when I would sing and um, it, it a lot of fear and um, yeah this progressed actually for a number of years until I got to the point where my voice got so locked up that I wasn't able to sing anymore. I, uh, I was asked to sing at a very uh, simple um, carol service one Christmas and I tried to sing a Christmas carol which was nothing that would ever have been difficult for me before and my voice was totally locked. I, I couldn't even get the sound out. And so I, I reached a point where I just felt like um, I don't want to do this anymore. Um, I, I can't. So I, 
I actually gave up singing completely. I, um, I, I went from the to, to the total opposite. I went from um, everything in my life was about pursuing this career and, and singing to actually pushing it away and not wanting to listen to opera music, not wanting to sing at all. And that's actually when um, A Course in Miracles came into my life and, um, and also David Hofmeister. And it felt like it was, it was an important transition where I had to fully let go because in, um, there, was, there was a real um, lockdown in my mind around music and around singing. But um, I do remember I, uh, when David Hofmeister came over to the UK and I went to a weekend retreat with him, I hadn't sung for a number of months before that. I had no desire to sing. It was like a full push away in my mind. And in this um, retreat, I had this heart opening experience where I just felt like my heart was bursting with love and had all of this emotion. And uh, I think it was the second morning of the retreat, I, I got out of bed, I woke up really early, and I just had this feeling like I have to sing, like there was something in me that I couldn't hold back. And before the first gathering started that morning, I, I just sang for about an hour and a half, just anything that was coming to my mind, it was just like pouring through me. And David actually invited me to come and sing at the Strawberry Fields Music and Enlightenment Festival. And I feel like that was the transition to the spirit starting to use singing and my voice in a very different way. Um, and over, over the years, I've had many opportunities to, um, to use my voice for the spirit's purposes, and um, and I can see now that you know the spirit is going to um, use everything because me pushing it away was not the solution. You know, it wasn't the way to heal whatever the fear and doubt that was coming up in my mind. It was a retranslation of what had been misused, misused by the ego before. So it's been a journey for me over the last five years to. Um, to accept the music back in and for it to come from a very different place. You know, for me now, I, I can only, s the only purpose for me with singing is that I feel that deep connection with the spirit and, and it's for a deeper healing. And there's a presence there that wants to come through and there's a joy and there's a heart opening and an expansion in my mind. And if that's not there, then music is, is pointless. There's, yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't offer me anything anymore. So yeah, with that, I, I actually just want to introduce Netta Boyne, and I'm so delighted that, um, that she um, has come on the show today. And um, yeah, for, for those of you who don't know Netta, she is um, a beautiful singer-songwriter who has just fully given her voice over to the spirit to be used um, to bless, really. And. Um, yeah, Neda, I, I would love just to, to hear from you and and maybe you could even share a little bit about your experience with um, coming into really handing your voice over to the spirit because I know it's been a transition for you. Uh, you you had a number of years as a out there as a professional singer and I know you were on the Voice of Holland and you did so like well in that and and yeah, just had these opportunities to really just shine your light. But maybe you could share a little bit about how you went from that to now releasing an album that is totally based on uh, <laughs> the teachings of A Course in Miracles. Right. right. Um, yeah, <laughs> it's been quite a journey. Um, so yeah, the songs that I, that I was singing, um, they were always very inspiring. Like they always contain a message. They always, uh, I never just made music uh, with like, oh baby, I love you so. And you know, this and that, like I always, from, from young, I, it was more about like one, I was really like in a state of mind where I wanted to change the world. So like my songs were very much of like protest and um, about women's right. And you know, like more like that type of thing. And then when The Course in Miracles um, came on my path, I think now about seven years ago, um, there was already a shift happening from wanting to change the world to wanting to change my own mind and 
my own my own mind about the world my perception of the world and um after studying the course for like two years i went to um like i <laughs> i gave up my whole thing of like oh i have to do everything alone so i i joined a group um and my teacher in that course group she was saying like oh you're a singer do you also sing songs from a course in miracles or like do you get inspired by a course in miracles to maybe write songs or something like that she said and i was like no way i would never do that and um more because the words god and Holy Spirit and like all those Christian terminology words, um, they really uh, had a big allergy towards them. Um, so I was quite surprised when maybe two years later or so, I just felt like somebody was literally just pulling me towards the piano where the workbook lesson, let me remember I'm one with God, uh, was lying open. and. Um, this whole song just poured through me like within half an hour and I was just crying and like writing it down. It was a beautiful song with lyrics all coming from that workbook lesson. I was like, what the F is this? Um, because it just really didn't feel like I, I wrote it. It really came through me and it had so much God words in them, like something that I felt like I would never write something like that. And I, I thought it was beautiful, but I also felt quite ashamed um, and then the next day the same thing happened and the next day the same thing happened and like this continued for two weeks until I had 16 songs entirely um, like filled with lyrics from different workbook lessons um, yeah so that was really crazy for me I was like what is this like I just couldn't ignore to write them down like I would try sometimes like I would say like no not now I'm busy when I would feel that that, that song coming in and then I don't know I just felt like I, I would get like so nauseous or something and I just had to sit down and write them down otherwise I don't know I just wouldn't feel feel, feel good so um, yeah it just took me quite some years actually to finally surrender to say like hey this these songs didn't came through me just to have them lying on a shelf you know these songs are so supportive for people and um it's 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 yeah they're just so healing and to support people on their path so it was actually in the voice of holland where i decided or where that decision was made in my mind like okay yeah i was standing there in front of the judges in a live show like with millions of people watching and I remember, like, I don't even know what the judges were saying to me, but I just remember saying in my mind, like, wow, I have a whole album lying home that is, its purpose is healing. And I'm here now in this show where everything is about shining and looking beautiful and making sure you get the most votes and making sure that whatever song you pick, the purpose of it is to get the most votes, like, just be the most popular one. And I was like, I have a whole song and the purpose is not that it's healing and that's where i decided like okay <laughs> when i'm out of here um i'm gonna do this i'll i'll surrender and i'll also very clear said to spirit like but i am not gonna do anything because i really don't know like i'm still very ashamed that i wrote these sort of like christian songs like how other people might perceive them they would think that i gone super religious i was like you take it over, I'll just follow. And I think that was the best thing that I ever did also to really hand over, um, hand over everything in this project and not to do anything myself and to just follow. Yeah, from there on <laughs> that journey began. It was just, it's been a crazy ride, but now the city is almost finished and I've learned so much and experienced so much miracles and it's just it's been really crazy but i'm very very grateful to, to be able to do this and to bring these songs to everybody oh that's beautiful i loved hearing like the way you just described the songs coming in like it was it was just a download like it wasn't a person writing them it was like them being received and it just flashed through my mind when you were sharing that the way helen shuckman you know described the the course 
being given right. to her. And, you know, she tried to, to push it away, but it actually was more painful to do that than to let it come through. Yeah. So, it's really yeah. beautiful. Yeah, I can really relate to that when I, when, and also that she was feeling so ashamed of it in the beginning, thinking like, oh, I'm so crazy. Like I had that too, like, what is this? Like I really, even still, honestly, right now, I like I'm getting better at it. But if I have to be completely honest, still, I still feel a little bit like not full, like it's, I'm getting there and I'm fully like, just oh here here they are but I still feel a little bit um scared or not scared but a little it's not fully healed yet that okay here's this Course in Miracles album it's still a little bit on the down low there's still this part that's like okay I know all of my Course in Miracles crowd will completely embrace this but how will other people like I feel I need to explain you know that it's not religious that it's not yeah there's still some stuff there so it's it's just a journey of really surrendering. But I mean, like at this point and already a long time ago, like I just couldn't, I couldn't resist anymore. So I really felt like spirit was also saying like, it's completely fine. Like I already got you. Like I know, I know you can turn back now. So I also felt like all of those doubts and all of those struggles there, there was so much space for that to just feel that and let that be there. And it, it I don't have to go faster than, than I'm going. And um, I feel like spirit has been guiding me so gentle through all of this. And it's just really like, even with, with making decisions, like there would be so much times where I heard from the beginning already certain decisions that would have to, that, that, that were there to, to make, like for instance, um, skip the introduction and the outro. Like first I had 18 songs and, that was just like an intro and an outro and I was very attached to them and I heard from the beginning already like they're not necessary and you know but then that brought so much fear like no I'm like sacrificing something you know so then I ignored it and like so much at times it came up but like so gentle I felt like it would just come up like this this inspiration like you know sweetie like really like that you really don't need it but it's okay you know whenever you're ready and then this week when I was really busy with um putting down the set list and deciding like which song should go first I heard it so very clear again like you really don't need the introduction and the outro you can just go into it right away and then yeah then I just I just felt like checking it with my engineer because I know like when two people are joined you know like you you hear the same thing so I checked with my engineer like I've been hearing this but just wanted to check with you and he was like oh girl I I never wanted those songs in there like from the beginning I knew like they weren't needed so you know it's like stuff like that so I knew like okay it's okay to let them go and then I heard so clear like they were always there for you and then I just got goosebumps all over because like the introduction it's it's a beautiful text from from the chorus and it's just basically saying like you know the light has come i can but choose the light for it has no alternative it has replaced the darkness and the darkness is gone the light has come like it was basically saying like there's no alternative like like you can turn back like there's this is already the cd is already there you know what i mean like all of this already happened like you don't need to do anything and then the outro is saying um, you do not walk alone. God's angels hover near and all about. Um, I will never leave you comfortless. So the outro, I feel like it was more for me to know like, okay, the city is now here and this is the outro. Like, I got you. You do not walk alone. I'm here with you. And um, yeah, so that I just had got goosebumps when I felt like, okay, so this was, this was for me. And yeah, it's stuff like that. It's just, really crazy but yeah it's beautiful it, it sounds like just even the process of putting this album together from you know when the song started coming through right through the recording and production there's just been so much healing and I know yeah. you shared with me when you went into the recording studio to record the song God is the love in which I forgive myself that right. you had like a huge healing experience maybe you could just share with everyone about yeah. That. yeah definitely yeah so it was quite funny because um i'm making a behind the scene documentary like a little short documentary um 
And when we, so when we first met, she was like, okay, so what do you want the documentary to be about? And I told her, like, I really want people to see that it's not because the album is called The Light Has Come, right? So I don't want it to just be all light and all love. I want them to see the darkness, that I had to go through the darkness, that it's okay. You know, the darkness um, is allowed to be there also. And I don't want it to be all like lovey and dovey. Um, so I told her that. And she, for the first filming session, she went with me to the studio. And every time I went to the studio, I would ask in, in, in meditation in the morning, like, which song would you have me sing for today? And I heard very clear, God is the love in which I forgive myself. And it, it was a pretty hard song. So I was like, are you sure? <laughs> are you sure that's the song you want me to sing? And I heard very clear, like, yes, that's the song. It's like, okay, are you sure? So I went in the studio and I started singing the song and she went with me and she, she was filming me. And uh, I was singing the song and it just, didn't go at all like my voice was just breaking up and I couldn't even go past the first chorus and I was just training myself and it wasn't going good at all and like after half an hour I heard like okay you're done now I was like I'm done I didn't even like nothing of this is good but I was like okay I'm done so I told my producer like Tony I think I'm done and he said yeah I think you're done too it's like, okay, uh, what is this? N different song or no, I felt like, okay, I have to go outside and just talk a bit about this. So we went to a park, like right around the corner from the studio. And I sat down and she put on the camera and she's like, okay, what happened? And I just started crying <laughs> and all of this stuff came up. And I was like, how can I sing this song? And because it's, you know, the workbook class, the right God is the love in which I forgive myself. Um, God doesn't forgive for he never condemned. Um, it was just so, there was just, there was so much guilt coming up, like feeling almost like a fraud to be able to sing this. I was feeling so much like I can't, I, I remember saying something like, how can I be happy if the people I love aren't happy? And um, I'm not supposed to sing this song and you know like a lot of a lot of shit just coming up and I ended saying like you know I feel like in the end it's all about knowing that Jesus got my back and to really feel that and to trust that he got my back and then we turn around and like right behind me there was this huge Jesus statue <laughs> that we didn't see like we walked right past it it was like I never like I never seen a Jesus statue in Holland ever, like especially in Rotterdam, maybe it's some small village, I don't know, but it was huge. And it was standing there with one hand on his heart and the other hand like um, open like that. And I was like, wow, <laughs> this is really crazy. And even my producer, he walked through that park to the studio every day and he never seen that Jesus statue. <laughs> we never seen it. It's like, okay, that's pretty crazy. So. Yeah, so in that time after, um, I had like another month before I felt the inspiration again to record it. And in that month, I had so much, so much forgiveness stuff to do and like so much healing. Um, and then when I went in the studio again to sing it, it was just amazing. It went so easy and just with so much, just effortlessly, it just yeah we had like six takes where I just sang the whole song from beginning to end and I was just crying while I was singing it and it was just beautiful mm. yeah so it's like every almost every song or not almost I think every song just took me through my own healing journey and I think maybe that's that's why it also I know I think that that might be very helpful so for people that will listen to it that and it was funny, you know, that it's on the documentary. <laughs> like, I was like, I want people to see the darkness. And then I understand why Spirit chose that song for that morning where she was filming. was like, you want some darkness? Okay, sing that song. I got a lot of stuff for you. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. I love that. I love the way you weren't even able to sing the song until you got in touch with with what was deeper and, and had that profound healing and like yeah. just really seeing that it's not about just singing a beautiful song. It's like being so connected with your heart in it and, and allowing something like real to come through. And yeah, I just, 
wanted to also to, to ask you a little bit about, um, about the work you do with waste liberation sessions with people because I think it's tied in with what you were even saying about your experience in the studio and and I know that that um, you and I have have been called by the spirit to be used in that way to to um, do sessions one on one or or in a group context and we've talked about this before and I know for both of us it's it's the same thing where it's not really about teaching somebody to sing or even you know having a beautiful voice came come out in the end even though that might happen but it's really using the voice as like an instrument to um to get in touch with something deeper so i think we just have a few minutes left but i would love if if you would be able to just share a little bit about about yeah that in, the inspiration for you to work with people in, in that right. way yeah definitely yeah i for me, it's the first time that I really, truly experienced the healing powers of, of doing the voice liberation sessions with other people um, in um, the Tabula Rasa retreat of David Hoffmeister last May, I think it was, right? Um, it was just a really beautiful experience because I did do like a two years education, like a school, a voice liberation school where, where I learned to give voice liberation sessions to other people, but I never actually really did it because I'm more used it for myself and to be able to just, um, just be free on stage. But then when I was at the retreat, I, even before that, I felt very inspired to do it. I felt like I'm, it's ready for me to also use the, the voice in this, in this type of way. And then with this work, I really, really experienced, um, for the first time, very, very, very clear that I really don't have to do anything because I still have some, some problems sometimes when, like with the CD, to, to just hear one voice, like then I'm, I'm hearing doubts and then I'm hearing this or that. But when I'm giving these voice liberation sessions, that's the first time that I actually experience and I really trust upon that I really don't have to do anything. Like I root nothing. Like it's so clear, like the voice, the voice of the spirit is just so so clear and everything is so guided of what i need to do and every time is different but like you say it's really not about um, bringing out a beautiful voice or like teach anybody to sing like i really feel like the spirit is just using me um to use the voice to just um see whatever wants to come up like to just uncover all of the darkness all of the layers that just are ready to shine light upon and it's I had some amazing, amazing sessions where it was just, it was just so amazing where you can just go straight through and go, you can just see people go through all of these layers and get to the core of what's really going on and to sing that and to express that. It's just so healing to witness that even. And yeah, I, I think like for the people that did it also, like their reactions and everything, it was really amazing. So yeah, I don't know, like every time it's just different, but sometimes it's just screaming and sometimes there's just this beautiful song that comes out and every time it's something different. But yeah, I can't really put my finger on it, what it is exactly, but yeah, I, I like that I don't have to do anything. <laughs> it's just listening. You feel, and, you feel yeah. the essence in, in what you're yeah. saying given moment by moment by the spirit and just Definitely. allow whatever needs to come through. I'm getting the signal that we just have one minute left. So okay. yeah, I just, I just want to thank you, Netta, for coming on the show. It's so beautiful to have you here and just to hear your experiences. And I, I want to share with everyone as well that Netta and I are both going to be singing at the Strawberry Fields Music and Enlightenment Festival um, this August in Utah. And directly after that, we're going to be holding a voice, the Heart Song Voice Liberation Workshop. So just exactly what Netta has been talking about, um, we're going to be, we're going to have four days where we're really going to use the voice as an instrument for this deeper connection with the spirit. So um, if you are interested in that at all, um, have, the website addresses for both events are going to be put in the comment box so feel free just to go and and have a look and and see the beautiful strawberry website with all the musicians on there and yeah just um just to finish off with um 
we're going to leave you with a, a recording of Netta singing at the recent ACIM conference in San Francisco, where she sings the song, God is the love in which I forgive myself, the one she was just talking about, how she had such a profound healing. So yeah, thank you, Netta. And thank you everyone for being here today. And um, I'll see you soon. Thank you. Love you. Mm -hmm. Love you too. <laughs> okay so are we going to that recording now or after okay great i just want to say thank you so much emily and, and thank you nada too i just felt so completely alight when you were sharing uh nada was just like oh my god that's i can really feel the resonance of spirit with what you were sharing so thank you <laughs> Yeah, thank you. And just to tack on to what Emily was sharing about um, Strawberry and the Heart Song Retreat or the workshop coming up, that's going to be early August. So you can catch Strawberry at uh, strawberryfieldfestival.com. And the dates on that are August 2nd through the 7th. And then the Heart Song Voice Liberation Workshop comes in directly after that on August 8th through 11th. So if you'd like to learn more and, and sincerely, we invite you to register, um, just head over to the website. So we will go to Nada's song, but just before that, I will mention the last show coming up in 15 minutes. The last show is The Last Step with Jeffrey. So uh, stay tuned with us and we'll be back.
biggest block for really allowing your voice to come out is trying to sound good and trying to sing. Um, so when I sing now and when I, when I lead groups or I do one-on-one -on -one singing sessions with people, I really try as much as I can to get them to step out of the idea that they're, they need to sound good or they, they need to perform and actually get in touch with something that's deeper. The best thing in this exercise is to not delay because when you don't even know the cushion is coming towards you, and you see it coming towards you and you hear a note, as much as you can just sing the note without any thought process, because I can tell you that thoughts are what blocks the voice coming out. So we want to minimize any thinking. <laughs> we want to just keep in the going. choir. I will refer to that a lot where I just ask people to, to whether it's to close their eyes or just to, to really get in, in touch with the sound that wants to come out and, um, and let that feeling lead the way as opposed to any kind of judgment on how anything, how anything sounds. So when we're, when we're singing as a group together, if everybody can even just tune into the one sound that's being created by the whole group singing together, it takes the focus off the personal self that, you know, is trying to do it. Actually singing is, it's like a metaphor even for A Course in Miracles because the Course is um, a pathway in letting go of the blocks to love's awareness. You know, love is not something that that we are taught or that we learn, it's who we are. And there's all of these blocks and beliefs that are in the way. So the path of the course is to, to see all of those blocks and let them go so we can get in touch with who we truly are. And I see the voice as being the same thing. We're all born with this natural voice. Everybody has a voice. So it's not about learning to sing. It's a process of unlearning. It's letting go of all the ways we try and control the voice, everything we try to do to create the sound, fully letting go of that and then letting this pure sound just flow through and there's really nothing that we need to do in that. It all, it, it's something that just happens by itself. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's the kind of feeling we're going for in everything that we're singing, just this really, really intimate sound. Whether it's a really upbeat piece and it's loud and we're dancing, or whether it's like a, a very prayerful song, it's like you still want to have that intimate, connected feeling throughout. I feel like something else is doing it. The spirit is doing it. It's kind of, I don't have to work anything out. I just, I hear a thought or I feel an energy or something is just happening and, um, and I'm just allowing it to move through and it is so joyful. And the experience is that at the end of it, I'm, I'm more energized. It doesn't take anything from me. It just gives to me over and over. So, um, so that's not just in music and in singing. That's how you know, I live my life. And I feel like everybody in this community lives their life, or at least we're practicing to live in that way. Um, and singing is just a, a, a great way for me to practice. <laughs> joining us today. We're coming up on our last broadcast of the day with Jeffrey and his show, The Last Step. Take it away, Jeffrey. Thank you, Kristen. Thank you, Peter. Oh, well, here we are. Yeah. A bit nervous again, which is, uh, which is good to feel. I was talking to Anne about having this before. I've spoken in the past and trying to retranslate this anticipation or excitement into something that can be used by the spirit. And yeah, it wasn't until just a few moments before that I actually had this prayer that I used to do every time in a 12 step room, I would actually 
when I was called on or would I would raise my hand, I would do that prayer of what would you have me say? And so I didn't really have any plan for today's show, but really to talk about a bit of what we talked about last week and kind of see where it took me. And uh, yeah, so I kind of explained last week for those of you who weren't with us about how I came from a 12 step program and I had a pretty profound experience as a result of reading the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous and practicing the steps and with the third step, which is, you know, the decision to turn your will over. I had a, uh, what the course calls revelation. And from that point, it was quite a journey actually. And I was explaining that it started all with this follow directions and it was something that I had never done before. And I had started to do with my first sponsor. And it's funny because when I prayed this morning, there were certain words that I heard. And, you know, the first one was relationships. And, you know, the course tells us that our path will be different, that you will, a holy relationship will be given you. And from the moment I had that experience, it was turning over every relationship I had and seeing the people that showed up. And they first showed up in the you know, in the guise of a sponsor and sponsees and all of that. And then it continued. And, you know, that's really what it was about was actually looking at every relationship that I had and turning it over to spirit. I've heard uh, David speak about, you know, handing every relationship you have over like a deck of cards, like throwing it out and just having each one be retranslated. And, you know, that's a lot of what I've done and what it looked like. And, you know, in the program, you know, I, last week I talked about, I wanted to, you know, discuss the later steps, you know, the spiritual maintenance steps, they call them 10, 11, and 12. But it really wasn't until step nine, you know, I had this profound experience, but to come into this consistent state, it was step nine, you know, and even in the book, which I actually have here today, I actually still read it. I don't, uh, I don't put it on a shelf and forget it because it had a big impact on my life. And, you know, the promises that they, they talk about in step nine, when I first read them, I was, I was blown away because it was Bill Wilson's, you know, attempt to explain what a spiritual awakening, you know, was. And when I actually read them for the first time, I was like, yes, like, cause I had felt that. And like, I was willing to follow these directions to get back to that consistent state of mind. And maybe I'll actually read them for uh, those. Cause I know some in this room don't even know of the promises. So it starts, uh, if we are painstaking about this phase of our development, and now this comes right after the ninth step, what the ninth step is, is it's like really repairing the past, they call it. It's the spiritual principle is discipline. Now we know discipline is in the mind, and it actually all starts with step three, that we make this decision. And now this is the outpicturing of this change, you know, once we straighten out spiritually, mentally, and physically. So my relationships actually started to change. So if we are painstaking about this phase of our development, talking about the ninth step, we'll be amazed before we are halfway through. We're going to know a new freedom and a new happiness. We will not regret the past or wish to shut the door on it. We will comprehend the word serenity and we will know peace. No matter how far down the scale we have gone, we will see how our experience can benefit others that feeling of uselessness and self-pity will disappear. We will lose interest in selfish things and gain interest in our fellows. Self-seeking will slip away. Our whole attitude and outlook upon life will change. Fear of people and economic insecurity will leave us. We will intuitively know how to handle situations which used to baffle us. We will suddenly realize that God is doing for us what we could not do for ourselves. And I was, when they'd asked me to read that, I used to always stress the will because that's, you know, this third step that we're handing our will over to that of the higher power. And for me, when I, I first did the ninth step, it was, you know, it was terrifying. You know, I, my first sponsor that I did it with, it was like, okay, who am I going to go do first? You know, and I had the list, and I made it all out. And a lot of people that I thought I really hurt and ones and, that I didn't think I owed amends to. One guy that I actually thought I owed amends and my sponsor was like, no, you owe that guy a thank you card. You know, it was like joining with him to figure out cause I couldn't make the decisions myself. So I remember I was at a meeting and it was on the ninth step and we were talking about this and I was on the ninth step with my sponsor and I had a list of people that day. I had three people that I was gonna go make amends to to start my process, you know, and 
I remember sharing it in the meeting and I was like, yeah, I'm going to go do these three people. And they were basically on my list. They were the easy ones. They were, I call them the cupcakes, the ones I could easily get done. So I left that meeting with the intention of going to the first one on my list. And as I drove, there's a, there's a split in the road. I can go two ways. I had to get gas first. And I went left to this, there was two gas stations. And I, when I went, I was down the street, maybe 200 yards, and there's three full grown turkeys in the middle of the road. And now my nickname was actually Turk because I was such a turkey. And now that's just the symbol here, but there's three full grown turkeys. Now, if you've ever been around turkeys, they're very spooked. They don't really stay. If they see you or anything, they, they run. And they stayed in the middle of the road. And I stopped there and I'm like, okay, looks like, and I turned around and I go, I'm going to the other gas station. I pulled into this other gas station. I pulled into the pump. I got out when I went to grab the handle. This kid looked around the pump right at me. He was the last, the last person on my amends list that I would actually approach. We were 200 feet from the location that I was high and drunk and smashed into his mother and brother in a car in the middle of the night. I looked around the pump and I saw him and I was like, Whoa. I was like, Dom, man, I'm happy to see you. And I knew it was, you know, it was given. It was for me to share my part because I was, you know, and I started to share a bit and I didn't really pray much in this moment, but I was like, man, I just want to tell you, I was so reckless. And if you could have seen the love come from this kid's eyes, he's like, man, I heard you were doing great. And the reflection was absolutely amazing. I didn't even have to say much. And I was like, oh my God. So I just started to share the joy with him. I'm like, I'm actually that later that day, I was going to speak at a corrections facility in Middletown, the next town over. I said, I'm going to speak this afternoon. He goes, I work there. I'm like, <laughs> so later that day, not only did I tell him what I was up to, later that day, I saw him in the parking lot of the place I went. So he could see it was, you know, something I was actually living. And from that point forward, I knew that I, I wouldn't have to be afraid of anything that I went towards, any of these relationships that I thought I had completely damaged, whatever it was. The next person on my list later that day, I'm driving down the street and sure enough, I'm driving by this house. I'm like, all right, make it obvious if he's outside. This was a friend of mine that I grew up with. He owned the local bar. He threw me out forever. Wasn't allowed in, in his place. And sure enough, he's never home. He walked out of his house to walk his dog and I pulled in and yeah, I had some tears there and I shared with him, you know, my part in it all the way that the program works. And it was absolutely amazing to see that once I was willing to give it over and it all started with that, you know, that deep prayer originally. And some of them looked really different, but it's this idea that if I'm willing to actually give them over, I'm not, it's not up to me. You know, as the course says, the curriculum's not up to me. I just have to be willing to see what happens. And probably the next one I, yeah, now they're just starting to come to me. This, this was before my, my next sponsor. And this was probably one of my best friends that, whew, yeah, he had seemed to steal a bunch of money from me and he was on my list and I wasn't sure how to address this one. And it was, uh, it was in June and I was leaving for a month to go up into the woods to do a hermitage of my own and yeah, I remember it clearly the day I was, the, I was leaving the next day and I was driving to an appointment. I had no intentions of talking to this guy at all. And I pull into this parking lot of the appointment and he pulls in behind me. He gets out of his car and it is the same experience. Hey, how you doing? It was like nothing ever changed. Like our relationship, like it was when, when we were in high school, we used to go up to this cabin, the two of us with other friends to fish and do our things and drink and all that. And I told him, I'm leaving tomorrow. And he's like, when you get back, we should, you know, we should go golfing. We should do this. And I said, yeah, here, you know, he was walking a lot. And I'm like, yeah, maybe we'll go for a walk. And he's like, yeah, you know, the Bob cheese feeding me. And, you know, it was like this interaction that was amazing. And tears came up, but it was like this, there was a piece underneath it because it was like, I was able to have that, that healing or that connection with him again. And this was all a result of me just handing over these relationships. And it was like, yeah, I forgot all about that one. Hmm. Yeah, so what it looks like now, today, uh, I'm in relationship with everybody in this room, essentially. I have a wife here, which is a surprise. But this is the course, you know, a holy relationship will be given. 
I never thought I would be married. I was terrified because I'd had broken hearts in the past and all that. And, and now I get to practice these things in a deeper way. And this is what, you know, coming from a 12 step program and coming into being in relationship with everyone, you know, it really is, there's no words to really describe it. You know, the holy relationship is transferring the love I can share with one to everyone. And it's like, yeah, I guess we can get to that. But my other, uh, my other experience with this, with this step before I got into the 10th the step and, you know, healing these relationships was with my second sponsor, Big Book Bill. And this guy was like, yeah, he was the most loud spoken guy in the room and I picked him. And when he made me do these steps, when he made me do step nine, he had me write out cards. This was my introduction to like intense mind training because I wrote out the person, the people, and I, you know, I was doing this again for ones that still weren't healed, you know, ones like my mother, my father, all these things. And so when I did them, I actually wrote out on an index card. This was my part in, you know, I was selfish when I, I was inconsiderate when I, and I would explain things that really felt, you know, deep. When I actually did the step in the room and writing them down, it was clear. I had no emotion. It was like, yep, I did this. I did this. And when I actually wrote them all down, I was like, this is going to be no problem. And I was directed to make an appointment with them, bring my card over, make a copy, hand it to them. I hold mine. I read the stuff. And then there's a question that I ask. And the question was, what can I do to make this right? And then it just said, shut up and listen. And to me, it was shut up and watch my mind and see where I wanted to defend or whatever it was. And I remember I did this with all my main ones, you know, my cousin, my best friend, Ace, my brother, you know, my mother and my father. And I thought it was, you know, when I did it with my mother and father, it was, it was amazing. I walked in and I handed him the card and I made it clear that this is what I was here for. We're not talking about anything else and I'm leaving right after. And when I did this, I actually, the deepest part I got to, the one, the one thing was this, I never allowed people to love me. You know, I, I wasn't able to do that. So when I actually said that in front of my mother and my father, I mean, I burst into tears. It was like, I'm sorry for not allowing you to love me like a son. And when I said that to him, it was like they were crying and it was like, and then I would shut up and listen and like, what can I do to make this right? And it was always nothing, you know, you don't have to do anything. And then I packed one, you know, packed up and left. And it was like, this was the beginning, these steps of like looking at these things in, in my mind that led me to, you know, wanting to go deeper. And I spoke last week about having that dream about David and calling Jason and coming to Mexico. And when I came to Mexico, I sat in the awareness center in Chapala and I was doing, I was in the uh, mystical mind training at the time and I was doing these instrument for pieces, you know, and I was doing all this stuff and I was, the turnarounds I did when I was there, I went after these bigger things like, the first one, when I was sitting there, I was like, I was there for like four or five days and I pretty much stayed in my room and forced myself to do these things. And the biggest one was my father because he was my biggest resentment. He was my biggest, you know, what I perceived as controlling me. And I sat and I went through these turnarounds and it was like, the thought is my father wants to control my life. And when I wrote that down and I was actually trying to force myself to think of the, you know, if you've ever done those turnarounds, it's like the opposite to actually think of those things. I couldn't do it. It was like, it was such prayer because I was so certain I was so right about this belief in my mind. And it was keeping me unhappy that it took me days. It didn't happen right away. It took me days to actually see, Oh wait, here's a way that he didn't want to control me. It was very subtle at the time. And it wasn't a huge shift in my mind when I wrote these out. It was like, oh, no, he let me do this, or he wants me to do this. He supports me in this. And so I went through and I did them all. And it wasn't this big pop. It wasn't this amazing thing, because these were deep beliefs in my mind. And, but when I went home, I went home. And when I, when I went to my father's house, my experience with my father actually changed certain things in the house. I used to have a seat that I would come in on the island. Like I would come in for dinner on Wednesdays and he would have a list laid out for me, things that he wanted me to do, check on this money issues, whatever it was, it'd be sitting there. It disappeared. He used to call me and tell me to come to work, come to 
have dinner with my mother. You owe it to your mother, you gotta come every week. He never called again. I was never asked to come over on Wednesday night. Now this was the reflection I had just by questioning this idea that my father wants to control me. And it went on, you know, this, this was a deep wash for me because it was like, this was my biggest victim belief that I couldn't do the things I wanted to do in life because I was being controlled by my father or whatever it was. And yeah, it started to, it started to make a huge difference in my life as I started to take the course and implement it into these interactions that I had learned to start doing with, you know, the 12 steps. And then it started to be, you know, when I got into the responsibility, the responsibility of the site. Now I knew from the, from AA that, you know, it was a self-imposed crisis and what I shared last week, you know, our problems are basically of our own making. But when I read the responsibility for site section, I was like, oh yes, I am responsible for what I see and hear. Because with my father, it was always these comments or things that I took personally, you know, fool, you ain't going nowhere. When I actually heard him say that and heard, I love you for the first time, I was like, I was like, oh my God, this is the way this man is showing his love for me, you know? And actually that section is probably, I have like three sections that I read over and over. And that one's probably the most influential to me. I read it most mornings because that's what I'm doing here. And like when I'm talking about following directions in the book, it says, you only need to do this. I don't even need to do the rest of the book. You only need to do this for vision, happiness, escape from pain, complete release from sin. And it's like, and then it says the next line, it says, say only this and mean it with no reservations. And when I read that, it's like, you know, to mean it. And that's what happened with me in the first step. It's like, concede to your innermost self that I'm powerless over alcohol was my case. When I did that, it was lifted. You know, I didn't have any desire to drink or do drugs when I actually conceded to myself that I was powerless. Now it was taking it to the next step. And it was like, all right, I need to say without reservation that I am responsible. And then it says, that this is the power of salvation. This is where the power of salvation lies. I'm responsible for what I see. I choose the feelings I experience. I decide upon the goal that I would achieve. Oh, I gotta take a drink. And then everything that seems to happen to me, I've asked for. I've received and uh, as I've asked for. And when I actually do that in every moment, that's what we do, you know, in this community and the people I live with, like there's never an opportunity to actually place the blame. There's never an opportunity to play victim. It's always this opportunity to stand, you know, in our strength. And yeah, it was funny. I, uh, as I was watching Emily's show and listening to Netta and I was there when she sang that at uh, San Francisco and it's like every time they sing, even Emily, she sings out in the garden. When I first got here, I got to the monastery and I remember waking up and she'd be like prancing through the garden, singing her songs. And I was like, it was like dreamlike. It was like so incredible. And then when I hear Netta sing at San Francisco, it's like, I'm filled with this, you know, these chills or these goosebumps. And so we're actually starting, starting a, a little group here in our house where we come together to sing. And I'm terrified to sing, completely terrified because I think I have a terrible voice. And what happened, I was probably told, I can't even remember this. I actually prayed and meditated on this. At some point, I think everyone was told that they had a bad voice. And I believed it. Like I believed it so deeply that I would never sing again. And now when I actually start to sing, I remember I used to start singing and I'd be like, I know I have a bad voice. Like I'd preface it with that. And these are all just the same beliefs manifesting in a different way to show me that, but none of it's true. It's like anything that happens or anything that I see reflected is actually, I'm responsible for what the way I feel. It's nothing to do with anything out there. So I'm actually making a public statement that I'm going to come to the next singing thing so that I can walk through that because I am scared. I actually did a voice liberation with, uh, oh, I see Eric up there. I was singing with Eric in San Francisco too. And I did that voice liberation. And when I did that, I did it once by myself and then I did it once with, Su once with Susanna, which you'll see in our upcoming documentary. But when I actually did it, I had an experience like I did a fifth step. It was like I did a fifth step 
every time I did a fist step or received a fist step from someone else, I had this feeling of being light, of being, you know, lifted. I had the same feeling after stepping through this fear of liberating this voice that I think, you know, doesn't need to be heard or whatever it is. It's like, it's funny that lifted feeling, it always comes to me after I'm healing something, a belief or a relationship. When I was in Camus one time, I had a call with my best friend Ace and I was kind of, I was really scared. Certain ones I would send emails to and say, hey, I'm training my mind here, whatever I was doing and certain ones I would continue to talk to. And Ace, I knew it was time that the calls were about his kids and just wasn't supportive for what, was, what I was going through at the time. And I kind of told him, I was like, hey, Ace, uh, you know, why don't you email me? And this was someone I used to talk to all the time. And he used to always give me a hard time for not calling. But at this time I said, you know, I'll call you or, you know, kind of just letting go of that attachment to specialness with my best friend, which was very difficult. And I remember when I hung the phone up, I actually got up. I was, I was in the uh, room five with Nicholas and I think Eric at the time. And I was just, I walked, I didn't know where I was going. I walked down to the library and I reached up and I pulled a book off the shelf and it was called uh, mirror on still water, this book that was there. And I just flipped it open. And the paragraph that I read was, we are held here by the gravity of our unhealed relationships. I was like, whoo, <laughs> I put it back and I was like, whoa, that's heavy. Like, that's what I'm doing here is like healing these relationships over and over. And now being in this context, I'm able to have these relationships reflected in all the people I live with. Like my wife, she's actually my brother, my mother and my father <laughs> at different times. <laughs> my friend, Bigger B, like I can go through the list <laughs> like at certain times. I remember at the first retreat I went to, like I went to a devotional for two weeks and I sat in the expression session. And I was like, oh my God, I looked around the room and I was like, okay, he's my mother. He's Ken's my father. And it was like all these people that were surrounding me were actually reflecting these unhealed pieces of my mind. And it was like, yeah, it blew me away to see that. And then the next step was actually to start working on those things. So all my authority issues come up probably with different ones, but they actually come up in this environment so that I can look at them so that I can actually take responsibility for sight. And it's like, this is what allows me to live in this place of the miracle and do all those things. So, oh. So we got seven more minutes here. Let's see what else we got. Yeah, actually, Frank, my uh, Frank that I spoke of last week is flying in today. It's funny because I told him that he would probably be the first uh, first guest on my show because he has been uh, part of the 12-step movement for 30 years, founded 12-step programs out in France. And, and he's coming down here and he's flying in at five o'clock tonight. And I told him probably next week I could have him on the show to share because he's actually making the same, the same type of shift to, from this, you know, the daily. And I, I had a few messages that came in last week that were like, yeah, I was in, I was in AA and, for 30 years and I, I quit or I was in for a certain amount of time. I don't know that I ever quit. You know, I actually went to a meeting with Andrew. I think Andrew's up there somewhere. I went to a meeting with Andrew when he was here for a month. And I got to tell you, I still get a lot out of it. You know, it's like this idea. I was talking with Jason the other day. Even if I left community for some freak reason, we said it was like, it's not like I would leave. It's like the ministry's in my mind and like, AA, hey, hey, I still feel is that way for me. It's like, it's always a part of me, that fellowship I don't think I could let go of. Certainly I'm loosening from the idea that I am an alcoholic. It's like, I actually stopped saying that before I found the course. I think I was listening to Wayne Dyer and he was like, I am that I am. And everything that follows in the I am is the name of God. I'm like, well, I'm not, God's not an alcoholic. I don't think so. So I changed it to when I would introduce myself, it would, I would just say, alcoholic, Jeffrey. I would just say it that way so that I could let go of this idea of that I am, that it's my identity. And then, yeah, I actually, uh, I was talking with Jason about this as well. And there was, you know, there's, when you start to read the course and it's like, 
accepting I am the son of God. I think I shared that as well, that the first time I said that I was terrified. I said it in a meeting. I was like, I just want to say that I am the son of God. <laughs> I was like, I was like to watch the fear to even say that, like what Netta was talking about, this fear of singing that song and meaning it and like this unworthiness that I can say it. And when, when I said it, I saw the unworthiness around it and like, then it became easier and easier and showing me what was in the way of that. But people that I'd been, I, Jason talked about a story of a guy he knew that was in the program for 30 years. And he's like, yeah, I've done the course. I had another guy back home that said, oh, Course of Miracles. Yeah, I did that. I'm like, you did it? I'm like, okay, well, if you did, you probably wouldn't be here. But the, uh, the point is, it's like same with 12 steps. You don't say to someone, you did it. No, I live that or whatever it is. So yeah, this idea of letting go of this idea of I am an alcoholic was, was pretty strong for me. And there's still something around it. Because I remember when I was so I was so devout on the fact that I wasn't for 39 years. And then when I found out I was, I was so proud that I was, was like, oh, it was like this, this shift, like this pride in the opposite direction. So I noticed that pretty quickly, pretty early on. And then even having talks with my sponsor at the time and my sponsor introduced himself as a recovered alcoholic because of the way the text is written. So he got into a lot of debates, but yeah, I'm not actually here to even debate any of it. It's like, I really just want to share what, what happened to me, like the steps I took and start to have some guests on so that we can talk about steps that they're either taking, want to take or have taken, you know, and I got a few emails from people that, you know, were very interesting and I'm going to explore that maybe this week and yeah, and go from there and we can talk about the last step, which isn't taken by us, fortunately. So I just have to do the rest of the work and then the last step is taken by God. So yeah, I want to thank you for having me today into your living rooms and I will turn it back over to Peter and Kristen. Thank you, Jeffrey. Thanks so much for sharing again. Well, that concludes our broadcast day. Yeah. <laughs> thank you so much for joining us. We'll be on next week. Um, same time. I think so we'll start at 10 a.m. Central Standard Time and, uh, of course, let you know if anything about that changes. But um, what I do want to share is that next week we'll have an, another five shows, but there'll be a different five shows. So just um, stay tuned and um, you'll see the lineup coming out a little later this week. And, um, yeah, we're so happy that you joined us and thank you so much. Yeah, thanks for joining us. So glad we can do this together. It's a gift. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Okay, we will see you next time. <laughs> <laughs> Bye.